Hello again, this is Mr. Hefner, just as you expected. And uh, in this short presentation today, we're gonna take a look at two topics. And I think they might be review for you, so we'll go kind of quickly. The first one we're gonna look at is we're gonna look at the seven elements of plot by using something called the plot pyramid. And I hope that is something you've worked with in other English classes before. And then we're gonna take plot one step farther and we're going to look at plot and how it relates to the idea of comedy or tragedy the way Shakespeare would have seen them. I think today our perspective uh, of what a comedy is is different from what it was in Shakespeare's time. So let's take a look at the plot pyramid first. I'm sure you've seen something like this before. Uh, some people will call this Freitag's plot pyramid. Gustav Freitag was a German playwright in the 19th century who, as far as I know, was the first guy to uh, diagram something like this and start putting names to the different elements of plot. It's been modified considerably since his time, and I'm not sure if we should give him credit anymore or just simply call it the plot pyramid. What we're going to focus on, though, is the seven elements. So we'll go through the seven elements, and then we'll look at how they connect to Romeo and Juliet. So the first one is going to be exposition. Exposition is any information, almost like an introduction. Exposition is the information that an audience needs to know in order to be able to go on with this play. So it's all the background information and maybe the introduction of characters. Then we have something called the inciting incident. We don't really have a plot without an inciting incident. This is the one thing that happens in the play that is going to set up the central conflict. And the central conflict is really going to be, in pretty much any story, something or the things that stand between a protagonist and what that protagonist wants. Right? So we'll call those things complications later on. So just keep listening again for that word complication. So once we have the inciting incident, we have rising action. If, if, if we have a story in which a character wants something and then just simply goes and gets it, that's not much of a story. So these things called complications stand in the way, and usually they're set up in such a way that every attempt to achieve what the main character wants is more and more difficult and less likely to succeed than the ones that happened before it. And so that increases the tension in the play, and when we get to the height of tension and the height of action in a play, that's our climax. And I know everybody's familiar with that term. And then we have something called falling action, which is the action that occurs uh, after the climax. But I want to correct something here. This, this plot pyramid is always drawn in, as I have it here, it's always drawn in a symmetrical kind of shape. Climax almost never, I, I don't think ever actually, comes in the middle of a story. Climax is usually much closer to the end of the story. And so we might see a, a longer slope for rising action and then a very steep drop-off for falling action. And, and a, a story doesn't end until we have this thing called the resolution. It's the action in the story which now ends the central conflict. Without that, we have a to-be-continued story. We don't have an end of story. And, and the seventh, the last and seventh uh, element here uh, is called denouement. And not every story has a denouement. Denouement is sort of like a little wrap-up at the end. It, it doesn't advance the plot in any way. The plot is essentially over at this point. And uh, all, it, all it really does is provide for a little satisfaction uh, for, the, uh, for the audience at that point. All right, so in Romeo and Juliet, what do, you, what do we have here for Romeo and Juliet? We have, uh, for the exposition, we have the chorus comes out, tells us about the feud that's been going on between the two families. We see the families fight. We hear the prince pronounce that, if ever you fight in my streets again, your lives shall pay the forfeit of the peace. That's a pretty severe punishment. And that's what's going to make things harder for Romeo and Juliet later on. But... It's really not a play yet. We don't have a plot just because people are fighting. The story really gets started with the inciting incident. And in this case, it's when Romeo and Juliet meet at the ball that night. This is now where the central conflict starts. How do these two get together, have a relationship, and, and make it work out while everybody else uh, is, is tearing them apart and, and fighting? So after this, we have the rising action. Lots of things happen here. Romeo and Juliet need helpers. Some people are reluctant, then they go along with it. Things are going to get in the way. By the time you get to uh, Act 3, which is, I believe, where you are right now, uh, you should find that it's complication after complication after complication. 
And all of these are going to increase the tension in the play till we get to the climax. Now, here's where I'm going to turn things over to you. From Act 3 through Act 4 and Act 5, I want you to decide where you see the climax of this play. Where is the height of action and the height of tension in this play? Now, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit to resolution. The resolution is, is the part of this whole thing where it's going to be all over for Romeo and Juliet. There's no longer going to be a need to struggle to get together. So falling action is going to be everything that happens in between the climax and the resolution. It might be two things, it might be ten things. But I want you to uh, make yourself a list as you go along uh, from the climax to what is the resolution and what are some of the elements of uh, falling action that are in there. And then ask yourself the question, is, is there in fact a, a denouement in this play? Not all stories are going to have it, as I said. So I want you to decide, do we have one that's in there for the benefit of the audience or not? All right, second part of what we're doing here today is going to be this idea of what's a comedy and what's a tragedy. So for at least a uh, 100 years, maybe more than that, uh, comedy and tragedy have been symbolically represented by these two masks, you know, the, the joyful mask and the sad mask or the, the comedy mask and, and the tragedy mask. And so I think today a lot of people would tell you, well, comedies are funny and tragedies are sad. And that's not completely untrue. But in Shakespeare's day, it was a whole lot more complicated than that. And think about this. You're, you're well into Romeo and Juliet, so you've met the nurse. You've met Mercutio. Both of these characters were absolutely loved by the uh, uncultured, un uneducated groundling standing you know, on the, uh, on, on the dirt floor around the stage in the Globe Theater. And they are very, very funny characters. And in fact, I don't know of a single Shakespeare tragedy that doesn't have one or two or, or maybe even more very funny moments in them. So tragedy doesn't mean you don't laugh at some point. So there's something bigger here. And some of Shakespeare's comedies have very poignant, very sad scenes in them. So let's take a look at what makes the real difference then. And we're going to use another graph. So uh, this is a graph that I put together, but you'll, you'll see how it works. So we're, we're talking about a comedy right now. So in this graph, the horizontal line at the bottom is going to represent time. The start of the play is on the left, and the end of the play is on the right. The vertical line is going to represent the kind of like the joy and happiness of our protagonist. So at the very top of the line, we have a main character who's got everything he wants. He might That might be wealth, it might be a loved one, it might be power, uh, whatever it is. They have what they want. And at the bottom, <laughs> this, uh, this in a Shakespeare play is usually death, but it, it's definitely sorrowful. It's unhappiness at the bottom of the play here. So what we have happen in a lot of comedies is we have uh, at the beginning, character starts out, something good happens, looks like life is going to be great, and then there's this unexpected twist, and it turns everything the wrong way. Everything starts to fall apart. Looks like our character is going to lose it all, maybe even die. And then there's another plot twist before we get to the end. And something almost miraculous happens. And our main character ends the play better off than he ever dreamed he would be. That's a comedy. So let's go through that one more time. But this time, let, let me actually summarize for you a Shakespeare play. Or at least part of one. So you take one of my favorite Shakespeare comedies and I... To be honest, Shakespeare's comedies are not my favorite, but one of Shakespeare's comedies is called The Merchant of Venice. And at the start of the play, we have uh, The Merchant of Venice, a guy by the name of Antonio and his friend Bassanio, and they both meet some girls. And they decide they'd like to, you know, be with these girls and impress them. Bassanio needs some money to be able to improve, uh, impress his girl, borrows the money from his buddy Antonio. Antonio says, look, I, I don't have the money right now. Uh, my money's sort of all tied up in a shipment that I'm waiting for. It's still at sea and hasn't arrived in port yet. But I'll tell you what, I got good credit. I can borrow the money and help you out here. And so Antonio goes to the villain in the play, another merchant by the name of Shylock, who hates Antonio. And Shylock says, sure, I'll loan you the money, but here's the catch. If you don't pay me back 
by, I don't know, he sets a, a time limit on it. If you don't pay me back by the time limit, I get to claim one pound of your flesh in payment of that debt. That's a pretty odd kind of thing, but Antonio's like, no problem, I'll be able to pay you back, dude. He borrows the money. Well, what happens is those ships full of the cargo that are out at sea that Antonio's been waiting for, they, they get lost at sea. There must have been a storm or something. Nobody radioed in. You got to remember in those days, ships just disappeared. They couldn't contact anyone until they came into port. But the ships are lost. Antonio doesn't have the money. And he's going to have to submit to Shylock. Uh, at the end of the play, close to the end of the play, it looks like it's all over for Antonio. They are in court. Shylock is ready to claim what is rightfully his. What he actually wants is Antonio's heart. And one of the girls... One of the girls dresses up as a man, sneaks into the courtroom, and plays the role of the judge. Now, for Shakespeare's audience, this was something that was very, very funny. Because think about this. You know that in Shakespeare's day, there were no actresses. All of the parts were played by men. So now we have a female character dressing up and playing a man. So what we really have is we have a man playing a woman playing a man. And this kind of gender-bending, costume-twisting kind of stuff was a, an absolute favorite of audiences back then. But she listens to the case, and in a surprise move, she says, Mr. Shylock, you're absolutely right. He hasn't paid you. You can claim a pound of his flesh. But, there's always a big but, let me warn you, your contract says nothing about blood. If you should take blood, that'll be a violation of the contract. And if this man dies because you took blood, well, that might be murder. And, and Shylock says something like, well, of course he's going to die. That's the whole point of the thing. And then it's pointed out that, oh, look at that. In, in Venice, it's against the law to enter into any contract that would result in somebody's death. And so the whole contract is null and void. Antonio doesn't have to pay back any of the money to Shylock because there's no contract. And just as a little surprise at the end, we also learn that those ships that we thought were lost at sea were maybe in a storm or something, but they come into port. Antonio has the girl. Bassanio has the girl. Antonio keeps the money he got from the villain Shylock. Shylock's been defeated, and Antonio's goods come in. Everything is awesome. That's a comedy, right? Now, what about a tragedy then? Uh, in a tragedy, it starts off almost like a comedy. We have a character in a, in a tragedy who starts out, something good happens, uh, things, are, things are moving along great, and then there's going to be this twist. Now, we'll talk about this twist because there's more to it than in a comedy, but there's going to be something that turns around what's going on for this character. And just like in a comedy, things start to slip off. It's looking worse and worse and worse. And then, since this is a tragedy, it almost always ends in the death of the main character. But it's not over there. In a Shakespearean or a classical tragedy, there's always a little bit of hope, a little bit of good that comes out of this whole thing at the end. Now, the thing that brings about the main character's downfall that makes this a little bit different from the twist that happens in a comedy. In a comedy, the twist that brings about the main character's downfall is often just a twist of fate. Oh my gosh, Antonio's ships are lost at sea. Right? He had no control over that. In a tragedy, uh, the crisis is going to be brought about when a decision is made because of something called a tragic flaw. So in our main character, our protagonist, we usually have some kind of a character defect. And many times these character defects are related to the seven deadly sins, pride, envy, greed, lust, avarice, gluttony, and, and sloth. And so these, these protagonists bring about their own downfall, which is why perhaps we don't feel we, we don't feel too sorry for them at the end of the play when they get what's been coming to them. All right, so let's go back again here, and, and let's, take, uh, let's take an actual play and see what happens. So in this play, uh, let, let's take the play Macbeth, the Scottish play. At the beginning of the play, Macbeth is a soldier in King Duncan's army. He fights a battle, and he does really well. And after the battle, he comes upon three witches 
And the witches tell him, hey, guess what? You're going to get a promotion. The next time he sees the king, he gets a promotion. So he writes home to his wife and he says, hey, guess what happened? And he tells the story of how the witches told him he'd get a promotion and then he got the promotion. So the wife is like, go back to the witches, you got to find out more. So he goes back to the witches to find out a little bit more. He's greedy, he wants power. And the witches tell him, ah, you're going to be king one day. That's pretty cool. So he goes home and he tells his wife, they said I'm going to be king one day. So his wife, who we only know by the name of Lady Macbeth, she convinces him, well, why wait? Let's invite King Duncan over to our castle. We'll have dinner. At night, we'll get his guards drunk. We'll sneak in. We'll murder the king. We'll blame it on the drunk guards. And you're next in line to become king. And so Macbeth makes this tragic decision right here to murder the king and take the crown by force. It's his lust for power, his greed for power, whichever one of those words you want to use, that is going to bring him down. Now, as the play goes on, he finds himself having to kill more and more people to cover up his tracks. And by the end of the play, he finds that his, his wife and everyone he cared about is gone. And it's just been a lot of death And he's very unhappy. And at the end of the play, he discovers that the son of the king he murdered has come back to Scotland with an English army. And they're going to fight Macbeth, overthrow him, behead him, and and take back what's rightfully theirs. And at the very end of the play, Macbeth is dead. (laughs) In fact, his head comes out and is displayed to the audience before the whole thing is over. But that little bit of good at the end is that the rightful king the heir to the murdered King Duncan, is back on the throne and all is once again right with the world. So the crisis occurred in this, the the one action that determines the future course for our main character was when Macbeth decided, okay, I'll kill Duncan and I'll take the throne. And then we have lots and lots of things bringing him down after that and they're related to the tragic flaw. And, and as we said, you could, you could put this with pride, you could put it with envy, you could throw in some greed, some lust, some avarice. Uh, the only thing that I wouldn't, the, the ones that I couldn't attribute to a guy like Macbeth is gluttony and, excuse me, gluttony and sloth because this guy is just, he wants it and he's going to take it. So that's the difference between uh, a classical tragedy such as Shakespeare would write uh, and just a sad story. The main character has to be brought down because of his own tragic flaw. Now, what I want you to do as you finish Romeo and Juliet through Act 3, 4, and 5 is I want you to look to see, do our main characters, Romeo and Juliet, do they have a tragic flaw? What, What character defect do these kids have that is bringing about their downfall, right? No spoilers here. You look, you pay attention as we go. All right, so that's going to be it. Uh, I want you to just take a look on uh, Schoology. Make sure there are no other assignments that go. I'm getting dizzy. Make sure that there are no other assignments that go with this particular lesson. Other than that, that's it for today. And uh, I'll hope to be back with you guys in class sometime really soon. Thanks for staying with me till the end.